Hey, how's it going? On today's Pokemon Solar Run, we are going to be doing Eevee. Not only that, uh, it won't be in the usual red and blue versions. Today is the debut of Pokemon Yellow. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the exact list of every single change up front, but as the video progresses, we'll get into some of the changes, and all you need to know is that it's basically Pokemon Red and Blue with Sprite and Trainer updates, and generally things are tweaked slightly to be more in line with the anime that started after Red and Blue but had blown up at this point in time. You pretty much start out with a Pikachu and you replicate Ash's journey more or less but mechanically it's identical to Red and Blue and for the most part it has all the Generation 1 quirks in it. I think it'll be fun to showcase the differences between the versions now that I'm more well versed in Red and Blue at this point in time. Now let's briefly talk about Eevee. And there's not really a whole lot to say. Its stats are pretty average across the board, and it only learns normal moves, and there's slight variations of what it learns from Red and Blue, mainly due to the fact that it's a starter for your rival. The TM list is also solely normal moves, with some exceptions of things like Reflect and Rest and Toxic, but no damaging moves. Up front, I'm predicting a fairly poor rank for Eevee. If it gets to C tier, I'd be honestly surprised. And this is not going to be a crabby or a tentacle run where I'm just shocked at how well it does and I'll just say that right now. It only has normal moves, it looks like it's going to be an abysmal Brock fight with lots of level ups, and there's going to be some other problems that we'll go into more detail about later in the run. But before we get started, I'd like to say that this is a cursed run. For whatever reason, Pokemon Yellow on its ROM did not want to cooperate with me. I ended up having to do this run four times. Four different Eevee runs because of either my own idiotic mistakes or mostly just technical problems. This one took a bit longer and I figured it was worth noting because by the time I made it to my fourth attempt I was much more knowledgeable of the differences between yellow coming from red and blue as well as the certain levels that I would need to make it smoother for Eevee as the run went on so it's not necessarily a blind run and it's more optimized because I had to try it so many different times. The last thing I want to say here is before we jump in is Feel free to subscribe and hit that bell if you enjoy this content. I try to do a challenge every week and I genuinely enjoy any comments. I like hearing suggestions, discussion, and even criticism. I just, I like it all. So let's get to it. From the very start, it's always worth mentioning that I do reset for an alright version of the Pokemon I'm going to be using and this time is no exception. And we win the first rival fight. It's not that important to go into detail, but as the intro plays out, I'll go into some mechanics with the rival fight in yellow version. So he starts out with an Eevee of his own, and what it evolves into depends on this fight and the optional fight to the left of Viridian City. If you win both, it'll be a Jolteon. If you lose one of these battles or pass up on the Route 22 battle, you'll get Flareon. And if you lose this one and either pass up or lose the other one, it'll be a Vaporeon. For the purposes of this run, Jolteon will be the choice. It's fast, and in the rival 5 battle, it'll have double kick, which is super effective against Eevee, so that's probably going to be the best choice in my opinion. Moving on, after you get Oak's Parcel done, the first difference between this and Red and Blue is that the catching tutorial from the old man is now mandatory. It doesn't take up too much time, but I do find it funny that he misses and has to run off to get more Pokeballs. The next differences that we're going to see is that there are several extra trainers located within Viridian Forest. The first is a last that has a level 6 male and female Nidoran for some starter experience. And then I fight the next two optional bug catchers and they are more or less the same from Red and Blue but after that I do head down to fight the rival 1A fight. And this time he doesn't have a Pidgey and he uses a Spearow instead which means no sand attack in this particular battle. I get down to a measly 2 HP but bad move choices from the AI get us past this on the first try and this will ensure that the rival will pick Jolteon later. Now it's back to Viridian Forest, and there's one more new book catcher. It's also optional, but I do fight it for some Brock insurance, but it's nothing special. A Caterpie and a Metapod. Standard bug catcher stuff going on here. On to the last bug catcher, and along with several other bug catchers, also swap out their usual Weedle for a Caterpie. And I guess this is because they didn't want you to get poisoned at the beginning, which was annoying. And this is supported further by the fact that they take out the antidote and replace it with a potion. After Viridian Forest fighting all the trainers, I'm level 11, and I take on the junior trainer before Brock. This fight has also had its levels reduced and makes it overall a much easier fight as most Pokemon normally have to skip it, 
I don't even have to use sand attack to get past this one. And when I'm done, it takes us to level 12, and it's time to face Brock already. In red and blue, this would be impossible at this level, but yellow does yet more balancing changes, and there are two major ones for Brock. Notice I use a potion rather than go back to the Poke Center to heal, and I'm not even full health going into this battle. The first change you'll notice is the level. Geodude is level 10 as opposed to level 12. The second is that it only knows tackle as opposed to knowing tackle and defense curl in the other versions. And the strategy is cheap, but it's simple. Sand attack along with tail whip will pretty much main the Geodude to where tackles actually do pretty decent damage and allows you to get past it easily. Next up is Onyx and it is also two levels lower than its red and blue counterpart. Sand attack and tail whips make this fight infinitely easier, and even after you set up, going for non-damaging moves during its bide turns is the correct play, rather than just tackling it down. And overall, it's not too bad. Getting this down at level 12 just shows you how much easier Brock is in yellow, and it was a pleasant and pretty welcome balance change. I don't really have any problems with it. In red and blue, I have no doubt I would need about five plus more levels to be able to get past this fight. And if you use a little logic, it's pretty easy to see why they would change this fight. I think it was overtuned in the first place, but now that you have to start out with a Pikachu, that's your intended starter now. I guess they didn't want it to be impossible for you to do, and that would just be my guess. Moving on, there isn't much of a difference until Mount Moon. I battle all the trainers because I need all the levels I can get for a part about halfway through the game that we'll go into detail about later. Something I won't talk about too much, but is worth noting is how great the sprites are going from red and blue to this game. The originals are not great, to put it lightly, but look at Paris here. He's really cute. Look at these little freckles on his face. This is this is serotonin incarnate for me. Another balance change is that the rocket grunt that normally has a randomly strong Raticate is now replaced and he just has a Rattata in its place. Good change. Now onwards, because I feel the beginning has dragged on a little bit too long, we get into the first big anime change here. After we get the Helix Fossil, it's time for Jesse and James, or just Rocket as the game says, and in this fight, they just have their typical Ekans, Coffin, and Meow. But after that, it's time to move on to Cerulean, where things are more or less the same for a little bit. At this point, I don't want to face Misty just yet, so we go on to rival number two. And I'd say the team is more or less the same. You would think it would be easier without Pidgeotto, but Game Freak decided it's not a challenge, it's not rival number two without Sand Attack, so it inserted a Sand Shrew in to fill that role. And it takes me a few times to get past this, pretty much all due to the Sand Attack luck. And eventually I just use Sand Attack myself against the Sand Shrew, and I don't even feel bad about it at all. The rest of the route to Bill's house was uneventful. Eevee does learn Quick Attack at level 23 in yellow version, and it'll be a staple in our moveset for a very long time. I do go out of my way to battle nearly every trainer on here. And then here's a gameplay change. Uh, I used the escape rope earlier so I can't show it off, but just take my word that you can no longer use an escape rope in Bill's house to go back to Cerulean. Out of all the things that they messed with in this version, I find that this one is the weirder, one of the weirder ones and I don't like it. Now it's time for Misty. After all the extra trainer battles to this point, we are level 26 and this fight is obviously pretty easy. Quick attack is more powerful than tackle and not only that it allows me to outspeed the Starmie. I don't even go down to half health and I finish it off with a lucky crit. Down in Vermilion, the next escape rope time skip in the Pokemon fan club also doesn't work and I think it's worth pointing out as well. After that it's on to the SSN and things stay pretty standard here. I make a beeline to get the TM for Body Slam which is the absolute peak of Eevee's power. I also get the rare candy and fight the gentleman garden it. After that it's time for rival number three and since we are level 29 Body Slam easily takes out the rival in perhaps the easiest time I've ever had in this fight. Afterwards I get cut but I do scour the rest of the SSN to battle more trainers. You gotta trust me while I'm battling all these trainers you just have to put some trust in me guys. But in the short term it's time for Lieutenant Surge and this fight got a lot less interesting and a lot more anime. This time around he only has a single level 28 Raichu. Remember I've done this run four times and I never had a single problem on this fight even when I was way under level than this. In this instant he goes for XP I body slam, it gets paralyzed, I immediately get a second body slam, and he's done. There's not much going on here other than a huge change in lineup to match with the anime. And since the Pokemon fan club escape rep doesn't work, I do go to the Diglett cave just to get the same results. 
and back in Cerulean, I pick up the bike and we head over to Rock Cave. And on the way there, there's a very funny and very relevant trainer added into the yellow version. Guys, it's AJ from the Sandshrew video from that one episode that I was talking about. The man himself. I was the one who broke his 100 win streak. Let it be known, my Sandshrew is far superior than this Sandshrew. Rock Tunnel wasn't too bad. I avoided any hiker trainers. But I figured I'd show the infamous double geodude graveler hiker I had to fight. I utilized sand attack for what's probably going to be the last time in this entire run and it doesn't really work as well as you would think. I do avoid the first self destruct with it but the next two actually hit me but I do survive with 7 health and we move on. I then take a dip into Pokemon Tower and we fight rival number 4. The changes from red and blue are the addition of a Shelter and Vulpix as well as the Sparrow evolving into a Fero. Body Slam and our level advantage makes this fight really easy despite the Sand Attack and I will say that for gameplay balance it feels better to have the Sand Attack user to be later in the battle as opposed to being the very first Pokemon. We then dip out and now it's time to go to the Rocket Hideout. I do battle extra trainers once again, and it's worth noting that I pick up the TM for Double Edge. It's a move that I don't end up utilizing a whole lot, but at the time I thought it would be an amazing move to have later in the game. This area stays the same up until you take the lift down to B4, and here we get our second run in with Jesse and James. Their team surprisingly stays the same all the way back from Mount Moon, and combine their low level with my level advantage, and you just have the recipe for wiping the floor with them. And now it's on to Giovanni, and we see some changes here, and ones that aren't too great for Eevee. He starts out with an Onyx, then into a Rhyhorn. Luckily we still have Tail Whip, and this is the first time I have made so much use of Tail Whip in a run ever, and I use it fairly deep into the run. I definitely got my mileage, and its contributions to helping out in fights like this cannot be understated. I also learned something new. Guard Spec is an item that makes it to where your stats cannot be lowered, and Giovanni will utilize them on his Pokemon in this fight. The strategy for this one is to use as many Tail Whips as I can on the high defense resistant Pokemon until he uses one of those guard specs. Onyx, I get off a lot of them, and then at that point Body Slam does like 95% of its health. Then Rhyhorn comes in, I get off 3 on him before he uses a guard spec, and then it still does pretty heavy damage and it's not much of a problem. Persian is also a new addition to his team, but it's just a normal type. There's not really much it can do. It's hard to gauge the difficulty of this fight compared to Red and Blue since I'm using an Eevee, but I'd say it's just a side grade at this point. When we are done with the hideout, it's time for Erica. I battle all the trainers in her gym to prepare for the upcoming nightmare, but Erica's team is about the last team in the run that sees a significant nerf. Tangela is the lead Pokemon, and it does have some grass moves this time, which is a definite improvement. The rest of her team, however, is just devolved from Red and Blue. We see a Weeping Bell and a Gloom, rather than a Victory Pail and a Vile Plume. Either way, I have levels over her Pokemon, and Body Slam gets this one done as well on the first shot. At this point, the first half of the game is over, and for the most part, the game is done being easier. And remember this whole video when I said, I fought all these trainers, I've been preparing, we'll talk about it later. Well this is the point, and this is going to be why Eevee ranks where it's going to rank at the end of the video. Now I have some footage from my previous runs and I'll be running it in the background while I talk about this situation and I can only describe this as absolute hell. So in Pokemon Tower you have to fight three mandatory channelers that use Gastlys. The specific headache is the first channeler that uses two Gastlys. So what's the problem here? Why is this so awful? Well Eevee can only learn normal attacking moves and it can't hit ghosts through traditional means. This also applies for ghosts hitting normal types, but in generation 1 their only attacking move is lit, but these Ghastlies have Nightshade that does damage based off of the Pokemon that uses its level. So in generation 1 there are several moves that are a little bit different. Seismic Toss and Nightshade are two examples. They both do damage based on your level when you use it, but they do topless damage which means that they ignore type immunities. So how does Eevee fit in here? Well there's one normal type move in the game that can hit Ghost and that's Bide. You know Bide, the TM that Brock gives you that's worthless 99% of the time but it also happens to do typeless damage. Now here's how Bide works. You use it and for a 2-3 to three turn window all the damage that you take is dealt back doubled to the Pokemon. Now this is the only way Eevee can get past this part of the game, but the probability of this happening is compounded with the Ghastly's love for using Confuse Ray. 
This is anecdotal evidence, but my personal three plus hours spent on this section alone over four attempts makes me to believe that you have a much greater chance of hitting yourself during confusion when you have bide going. This isn't really factual or anything, but it's just a feeling that I have over experiencing this over hundreds of attempts. So now we've set up how it works, but what needs to happen? Well, if Eevee uses Bide, you avoid any Confuse Rays, and then get hit with a single Nightshade from a level 23 Ghastly, you'll deal 46 damage back to it. Now the real problem arises when you realize that a level 23 AI controlled Ghastly has about 50 HP, maybe a little less, but around 50. And that means that it'll survive a single night shaded bide with a sliver of health. This means that in most cases, you're gonna need two night shades to hit you and then get off a of bide. Ideally, the fight's gonna go like this. Turn one, you use bide. Turns one for the gasoline and turns two, it uses back-to-back night shades and then you only get a two turn bide and then you'll deal the damage back and that'll be enough to knock out the ghastly. The second ghastly comes in, the same thing happens and you move on with your life. This means that if things go absolutely perfect, you need 93 health to survive a perfect scenario to get this win. But as anyone that's not naive knows, Things rarely go perfect in any situation, life, games, it doesn't matter. But I found that if you want to get a buffer and let yourself get through this in a timely manner, you want to have about 116 health or so. This is the number that got me by on this attempt in less than 20 minutes, and this is where all those extra trainer battles really help. Anyways, I'm being really long-winded about this, but I cannot stress enough how awful this part was overall. And the worst part of this was the fact that I had to do this over multiple runs. There is a bug I did discover. I don't know if it's new or not, but if you are confused while you take a single nightshade from a ghastly, but you avoid hurting yourself all those times and you get off the damage, you'll do more than 46 damage and you'll outright kill the ghastly in one hit somehow despite a regular nightshade not killing it. It's incredibly difficult to replicate, and I think I do on some of this footage, but I actually managed to win like that one time. But eventually, eventually guys, you'll get the required luck to get past the first channeler, and I'd like to reiterate and stress as hard as I can. I'm stressing really hard right now. Listen to me. How tedious and roll of the dice this segment is. This is 100 times worse than anything I've ever done in any Pokemon game up to this point, and when we evaluate Eevee at the end, you can you, you can bet that I'm taking points off for this. Now on to the second and third channeler. They are way easier just because they only have one Ghastly. I actually get past them in a single attempt, both of them, one shot. Although theoretically they could give you some trouble, but what's important is that this part of the game is over with. And keep in mind, I'll say this one more time, I did this part for times and I'm a changed man at this point. Finally moving on, the only thing that is different in Pokemon Tower is instead of the little rocket gauntlet at the top, you get to fight Jesse and James again. And this time they've actually evolved their Pokemon, but the fight is pretty much the same and they're just a road bump and we're moving on again. They're blasting off again, guys. After that, we get the Poke Flute and I call an audible here with my knowledge of my three previous runs. There's really no easy options left in the game. So instead I go to Silphco. But not to fight rival number five or Giovanni yet. Uh, it's just to beat down all these sussy baka rocket grunts and we pick up the various vitamins and goodies littered around Silphco. And I probably battle about 70% of the trainers here in preparation for some of the harder stuff coming up in the game. When I clear out Silphco, I head out to beat up on Snorlax once again and I make my way towards Fuchsia City. And once we're there, I do fight the trainers leading up to Koga, and I finally reach him about level 52, and you need to have some power to get through this fight. You need to be beefy and be able to do a lot of damage to get past this fight. Because you see Koga, he's also changed. He has three, count them, three Venonats, and a level 50 Venomoth at the end. From all I can tell, the first Venonats AI wants to put Toxic on you and pretty much put you on a timer from the very start. It does this most of the time, sometimes it won't, you know how the AI works. The first one also has Sleep Powder, and all three of these little Venonats have Psychic. I managed to get past this one on the first time due to my increased level and experience, 
but trust me when I say this fight is very annoying and difficult if you come in here at let's say level 42 or something like that. It's kind of like Yu-Gi-Oh where he throws out the Karibos at you and wears you down and then pulls out the Venomoth at the end and he wants to just double team and finish you off while you're taking toxic damage. And I'm definitely not a fan of this Koga change, but that's not saying that I think the design in red and blue is good. I do think there's many poison types in Generation 1 and why not give them a good mix of them all? I mean, we go from two coughings, a monk, and a wheezing, to three Venonats and a Venomoth. It's not interesting, and it's just worth pointing out. After that, I'm really not ready for Blaine either, so rival number five is the last place we can go, and this fight is also pivotal to have a higher level on. As far as I know, it'll take way higher level than this to outspeed the Jolteon, but you need to be able to get Body Slam into two shot range for most of his Pokemon to have a good time. The Sand Slash is his first slot Pokemon, and there's several annoying things that it can do. Two Body Slams do take it out, and it only does a Swift in between those, so we have no status conditions and we have high health moving on. Next up is Ninetales, and it's not an issue. Even if you're at lower level, it's not a challenge. Next up is Cloyster, and this is a huge worry, and perhaps this is a little bit of foreshadowing, but the Pokemon with the highest defense in the game against a Pokemon that only has physical attacks can potentially pose a problem. In this particular fight, I still have Tail Whip this late in the game, and I'd like to just say again how useful this inconspicuous move has been for me in this run. It allows me to take out the Cloyster with relative ease. Kadabra is still frail as always, has zero defense, and it's no surprise that it gets its back broke with a body slam. And finally, it's Jolteon. And this thing is very fast. I don't think you'll ever outspeed it without sacrificing hours of your in-game time or using rare candies, but it has access to double kick for this fight. And if you can't two-shot the previous Pokemon, you'll get chipped down and double kick will take you out. That's what happened on my other runs. You have to make it to this fight and be able to get it down with a body slam. You do heavy damage and then you can follow up with a quick attack. Or in this case, I do just another body slam since we're so healthy. After that, it is our last Jesse and James fight. They don't change Pokemon at all and they're not worth going into detail other than just showing the differences between yellow and red and blue. Now it's on to the second Giovanni fight, and unlike Red and Blue, this is the easiest fight by far for Giovanni. Only one of his Pokemon resists Eevee's normal moves. He starts off with a Nidorino, and then he goes into a Persian. I have nearly 20 levels of advantage over his Pokemon, and this leads me to believe that perhaps in Yellow, this is the intended route to go to before you go to Koga, considering the levels of the previous rival fight and then how high Koga's levels are. Rhyhorn is the only Pokemon he has that resists our moves, but we still have the most underrated move in the game, Tail Whip, and we take it out pretty easy. He also has a Nidoqueen, but although it has Double Kick, it's not as much of an issue in this fight as it will be later. Spoiler alert. Next up is Sabrina, and I think this fight is overall very nerfed. She essentially only has two level 50 Pokemon, a Kadabra and an Alakazam. The other one is an Abra that doesn't even know any attacking moves and they are weak defensively and the removal of Mr. Mime and Venomoth definitely removes some of her depth and challenge from her counterpart. When we're done with that, I pick up a very important TM in Mimic and then it's time to head down to Cinnabar and I accidentally run into a trainer for the first time by not paying attention. Wow. The next change from red and blue I'm not a fan of is that in Blaine's Gym, you cannot challenge the trainers directly and you have to answer the questions before you can do so. I get that some kids may not know that you even have the option to answer questions to skip these battles, but this one just wastes time if you actually want the experience. But there's one thing that doesn't change, and that's something I'll always answer in my heart, and that's Tombstoner, brother! Onwards to Blaine. I lose my first attempt due to getting chipped down, but his team is significantly better and higher level. Gone are the pre-evolved Pokemon, and instead we have a Ninetales and the usual Rapidash and Arcanine. The Arcanine is a massive level 54, and the AI seems to be a lot better because Blaine didn't seem to use Super Potions a lot in this version. Since I leveled up, the second attempt I'm able to get past him. There's nothing special here. I can't outspeed his Pokemon for the most part. All I can do is hope that I don't get burned or hit with a fire blast or something like that. And that's exactly what happens on this try. I do get some luck on the Arcanine. I get the Paralysis on the first Body Slam, which means I essentially get back-to-back -back turns. And the second Body Slam gets it really low. 
and it goes for a reflect rather than like a fire blast and then a little bitty quick attack is enough to get us past it. And now it's time for the last gem. I battle all the trainers up to Giovanni because believe it or not, I still need levels heading towards the end of the game. The nightmare is not over yet, guys. And if you don't count the hours of using Bind on level 23 Ghastlies, Giovanni is by far the hardest fight of this run and that's pretty surprising considering that I often say that this is the easiest version of Giovanni in Red and Blue. He is so much improved in every aspect in Pokemon Yellow and he has the perfect answers for a solo run Eevee. And I'm just going to let a lot of failed attempts play in the background here as I talk in depth about some of the problems that this fight has. The first part isn't that bad, but it's still not great. The Doug Trio is extremely fast and outspeeding it isn't really an option. Since it outspeeds and has access to Fisher, it can get off a one hit knockoff, but that rarely happens. I do think it happened on one try, but I don't show it in here. I couldn't find the footage. But other than that, it of course has Sand Attack. It also has Dig, which is annoying because it'll make you miss. And he also has access to Earthquake, which is the same power as Dig, but they are both really powerful stab moves for Doug Trio. The bright side to Doug Trio is that a single body slam can knock it out, but there are just several things that it can do to make your life a little bit harder as you progress in the fight. Next up is Persian, and I wouldn't call it an issue. It does have access to double team, and if you take a sand attack previously from Doug Trio, you may as well just hit the reset button because you're just going to struggle here. It also has access to Slash, which will almost always crit and do a pretty decent chunk of damage that isn't really dangerous on its own, but when you get to the later parts of this fight, it makes it very rough. It can also use Screech, which will make the rest of his Pokemon absolute shred you. What you want from this point in the fight is for Persian to go for Fury Swipes so that you can get to the next Pokemon at pretty decent health. Next up is where the fight starts kicking off. Uh, Nidoqueen comes out and it has access to Double Kick and it's super effective and does pretty heavy damage. Combine that if you've been already chipped down or if you've had a Screech put on you, it's brutal. Body Slam isn't nowhere near enough to get rid of it quickly in a timely manner unless you use Tail Whip, but that does cost you a turn. And if you make it past Nidoqueen, Queen, it's time for Nidoking, King, and it also has Double Kick. And not only that, it does way more damage than its Queen counterpart. The fact that I can't deal with the Nidos fast enough while taking super effective damage back really makes this fight difficult. And that brings us to the last Pokemon, it's Rhydon. It's an underrated Pokemon, I think, and that's probably because it has multiple times four weaknesses, but against Eevee, it's an absolute wall. It resists our attacks and has massive HP and defense. And that's all fine and good, but the actual problem here is that most of the time that you make it here, you are extremely low on health and there's really nothing you can do. Even if we're at full health and we could set up Tail Whips, Maybe we can get past it, but just a default body slam doesn't even do 20% of its health and it's pretty much impossible at this point. So something needs to be done, strategies need to change, and for that we head over to Celadon and we pick up the TM for Reflect. Then I teach Eevee Mimic by replacing the obsolete Bide, and then I learn Reflect and I replace Tail Whip. And I'm sad to see Tail Whip go because it really put in work during this run, but I simply cannot afford to keep it at this point in the game. So this puts our moveset at Body Slam for our damage, Quick Attack to finish off Pokemon that Body Slam can't, or to get a quick outspeed, Mimic for the Toolbox utility, and Reflect to basically half all physical damage directed towards us. But at this point it's still not enough. I try this battle about 8 more times. And at this point, I need to level up a little bit. I should have probably went to Pokemon Mansion looking back at the footage, but the first place I think of is the trainers on Cycling Road. So I head there and we get a couple of levels and then we head back to Giovanni. And this was exactly what I needed to get past this fight. Turn one, I take a beefy earthquake, but a single body slam gets us past. Persian comes in, we get a guard spec from Giovanni, so I set up the reflect. I get hit with a screech, but a body slam takes it down to the red, and a followed up quick attack can move us on to the Nidoqueen with pretty decent health. Turn 1, I mimic Earthquake and we get a guard spec once again from Giovanni. Turn 2, Earthquake deals pretty heavy super effective damage to the Queen. I do get hit with a double kick and it hurts due to the screech that we took earlier that pretty much nullifies the reflect but another body slam takes us on to Nido King, and it comes in and an Earthquake just barely misses knocking it out and we get really lucky here, we get another guard spec 
and we promptly finish it off without taking further damage. Now it's time for Rhydon, but this time we have Reflect Up and a super effective Mimicked move. Earthquake crits, but it doesn't finish it all. We take an attack, we go down to a very low 15 HP, but since we outspeed Rhydon, I decide to not take any chances and I finish it off with a lethal earthquake. The hardest battle in the game is now done. And that's just the regular season, and it's over. And I'm wondering at this point if I'm ready for the last six battles, because I barely just made it past the eighth gym. I don't really take that much time to reflect, and we head straight over to rival number six, and that'll give us a pretty good indication of how we're ready to stack up. And after this battle, I'm feeling pretty confident. I get past it on the first try despite really awful luck. The Sand Slash takes two body slams to go down, and it goes for a pathetically weak Fury Swaps between those. And I'm not sure why he still has an unevolved Execute, but it charges up a Solar Beam. I set up Reflect, and I go for Body Slams, but before it goes down, I take a critical hit from the Solar Beam, which isn't ideal. Nine Tails isn't an issue, but it does hit me with a critical Quick Attack to chip me down a little bit further. A Body Slam into a Quick Attack was enough to finish this one off, and now Cloyster comes in. Cloyster is the problem here. I get lucky and I get a critical hit on a body slam, but it's not even close to enough to kill it. Cloyster then proceeds to get the extremely lucky 5 hit clamp that takes me all the way down to 21 HP before I finally finish it off. Next up is Kadabra, and I outspeed it, and it's so frail that it's just one and done. Last up is Jolteon, and it's worth noting that at this point in the game it no longer has access to double kick, which is pretty great for Eevee. It already outspeeds us, and at this point we're at the mercy of the AI, but it goes for agility. This allows us to get off a body slam, and it makes it to where it's low enough to where we can just finish it off with a quick attack, because everyone knows quick attack does not care how fast you are, even if you use 100 agilities, fight me. And this has got me feeling pretty confident. Heading on towards the Elite Four, I feel that I'll still need some levels, so I ration out my PP so that I can fight all the trainers in Victory Road and I make my way through it. Looking ahead to the Elite Four, I think it's funny because I think that Bruno is going to be one of the biggest issues here because he's much improved over Red and Blue. And I also think that the champion fight is going to be rough, but we'll just, we'll see how it goes. It's worth documenting that my original strategy throughout the run was to get and sell everything that I could. So when I make it here, I can go sell and get some vitamins. I saved up over 225,000 Poke Dollars, but it turns out that all the extra battles pretty much filled up all my stat experience and all the vitamins had no effect. Cool. Now let's take a dive into how the Elite Four went. And surprisingly, after the bumpy road, the bumpy journey that we took to get here, this went surprisingly smooth. While I did fail some Lorelei attempts, I'm not going to show any failures because it wasn't that bad. Uh, I ended up doing a very simple strategy and that was a uh, body slam into a body slam into more body slams. Originally, I wanted to mimic Amnesia on the slow bro to make Lapras not hit as hard, but I opted eventually in my last run to pretty much just go straight body slam. And in my last try here, I do get confused. Eventually, Slowbro starts to chip me down pretty low, and I gotta say that Yellow's version of Lorelei's Slowbro is much better. It has Surf, it has Psychic, and then it has two defense boosting moves, and it's a major improvement. The rest of the team is more or less the same. Jinx was always a one hit from the very first attempt, and Lapras always has the problem of being able to crit and being tanky. In this specific try, it does miss a Hydro Pump that may or may not have ended this particular run, but a Body Slam triggers a potion and it lets us move on. There's not much to say for Lorelei outside of Slowbro being much improved, and that makes me happy because Slowbro is my favorite Pokemon. And now we get into the real meat and potatoes here. It's Bruno, and let me say up front that this does not count against my 3 and 197 record I have against Bruno in red and blue. In my first several runs, I just deal with the Onyx through brute strength. I just body slam it down. My plan initially was to take Ice Punch from the Hitmonchan to deal with the second one. And the strategy is not the worst ever, but it turned out not to be great either. The problem overall in all these runs I'm going to show is the Machamp. Submission absolutely destroys Eevee and does massive damage, especially if I take a Screech from one of the Onyxes early. The second reset, I thought the exact same thing. I mimic Ice Punch and the overall attempt goes pretty well, but look how much damage this Machamp does to me with Submission. It's pretty nutty and makes me kind of sad. Eventually I come up with a more consistent strategy. 
I mimic Dig on the first Onyx. That means I won't give Hitmonchan an immediate free turn and I'll be able to deal with the first Onyx more effectively as well as hide from the Machamp at the end of the fight a little bit. On this attempt, Hitmonlee gets massive damage off on me and by the time I make it to the Machamp, he could pretty much just flick his finger at me and I'll die. And this brings us to the last attempt. Those were the only three failures I had on Bruno and in this last attempt, it's just like I laid out already. I mimic Dig and it plus body slams make pretty short work of all of his Pokemon and then comes in the Machamp and I dig and I hope to avoid any submissions and in this case he really doesn't even try, he goes for Leer and stuff like that. I get him low enough eventually to where a body slam can just finish him off and then I move along. Next up is Agatha and I can confidently say that Agatha is much easier in yellow version and I'll talk about it as my only two times that I was defeated play in the background. Now, I made the mistake of this entire run when I was looking through making the initial plans. I was going to mimic Nightshade to use on Agatha, but to my shock, and I should have done more research here, none of Agatha's Pokemon actually use Nightshade in Yellow version. In fact, the first Gengar is all but neutered, and he is often the kingpin of what makes Agatha such a challenge. Instead of mimicking Nightshade, you have to go Lick, which isn't as good as Nightshade, but it's still pretty effective. It's super effective against the ghost. The first Gengar also doesn't have neither Hypnosis or Dream Eater, and it does make it very easy to get past in comparison to the red and blue versions. Golbat still has the unreliable Supersonic, but the big nerf is that it no longer has Haze to reset or even take off the base level badge boost. It does have Toxic to replace it and that can be annoying. The rest of the team is roughly the same except for the final Gengar and this time it has Toxic replaced with Psychic making it much better although it never really came into play much. Both of my two failures against Agatha came on the last Gengar with the second one coming from massive toxic damage, but it was very surprising how consistent and easy this fight was, and it was almost bizarre when you compare it to the early Bruno attempts I had. So let's get to the final run. At this point, we are level 69, and we use all of our rare candies, and outspeeding the Gengar makes this fight pretty trivial. Turn one, you take Lick, and generally with our massive level, you just keep licking until it goes down. Its only damaging moves are Lick and Mega Drain, so it can't really do much. Although sometimes it can be annoying, it'll confuse you and it'll use Substitute. Next up is Golbat, and while Body Slam doesn't outright kill it, it'll get severely low. Worst case scenario is that it'll use Toxic, but this time we get a Retroactive Potion, and a follow-up Body Slam gets us to the Haunter, and the Haunter is also the same from the previous version. It does confuse me, and I hurt myself a little, but it doesn't really follow up, and a cute little Eevee lick brings it down. Arbok is the exact same as Golbat. Body Slam isn't quite there for a one-shot, but a retroactive potion makes us take it out in the next turn. Last up is Gengar, and it has a good moveset, but more importantly we answer the age-old question of how many licks it takes to kill a Gengar. And the answer is three. Does anyone in my audience remember the Owl Tootsie Pop commercials? No? Cool. Moving on, we have Lance, and Lance was by far the easiest member of all the Elite Four members. As a matter of fact, I never lost a single time to Lance. Even Lorelai, where I only showed the final attempt, could still beat me, but Lance just never stood a chance. The final attempt is the worst case scenario for Lance, but we still win pretty easy. I set up Reflect to ward off any pesky Hyper Beams, but in this battle, Gyarados goes for a turn one critical hit hydro pump that half helped me. Two body slams with a leer between by the Gyarados is enough to get us on to the next round. And looking at Lance's team, they're pretty much the same, but his dragons have gotten rid of their stat boosting moves, and perhaps that was to kind of band-aid the poor AI against poison types. The first Dragonair does go down to a single body slam, but it's not important. What is important is that the second Dragonair has agility replaced with Ice Beam. So we mimic that Ice Beam, and that allows me to one-shot it along with the Aerodactyl and then the Dragonite with relative ease. And this is pretty much how every Lance fight went, and it was usually smoother than this attempt, but this was the final attempt, and that's usually the one I show. And last up is the champion, and this is another fight that gave me some trouble. I went through this with various strategies in mind. During my first attempt, I was trying out Toxic, and the idea was to turn one reflect and then mimic Earthquake from the Sand Slash, but things go awful 
when a measly poison sting hits me and then the poison chance procs and I get poison and we're on a pretty much a timer for the rest of the battle. I end up taking an earthquake and several turns of poisons. Eventually the champion does a full restore and it forces out even more turns of poison but eventually we move on and next up is Alakazam and at level 80 I outspeed it and I do enough damage to one shot it. It's not an issue in this run at all. Executor comes in and I'm already getting low. I debate on using Toxic, but I don't have the health to back it up. So two Body Slams take it out. It does get off a Leech Seed on me before it goes down, and that basically halves the time I have left in this battle. And now, let me introduce you to the Run Ender. The very high defense, suspiciously vagina-shaped clam cloister. At this point, I'm way too low. It would take about three Body Slams under normal circumstances, but Leech Seed plus Poison along with Cloyster's patented Ice Blast ends this run. The second temp has the same end result, uh, but the details are slightly different. This time I take two critical hit slashes from the Sand Slash. Say that two times fast. Three times, four, I don't know how many times you want. But Executor gets off another Leech Seed. I try to put Toxic on it, but that's a pretty stupid strategy. And when Cloyster comes in, I use Toxic again in kind of a Hail Mary desperate attempt that never really had any chance of succeeding. And on our third attempt, I try to use Double Edge over Toxic, thinking that that huge punch might be enough for me to get past the hump, and I was wrong. I test out Double Edge on the Sand Slash, and it would still take two, so I should have just used Body Slam. I get poisoned, then I get critically hit with a Slash, I get chipped down, but I do get a, a critical hit Double Edge on Executor to one-shot it, but Cloyster would take two Double Edges to go down, and at this point, once again, I'm too low, I keep using Double Edge to go out with Honor this time, and this strategy's not working either. So finally, finally we make it back. And this time, we need to be smart. Turn 1 Reflect. I get hit with Poison Sting. I do not get poisoned. Turn 2 Body Slam. Sand Slash misses with Fury Swipes, and the Turn 3 Body Slam makes it go down. I avoid nearly all damage on this attempt, and it's looking pretty good. Alakazam comes in, and this is where the change up to the strategy comes into play. I mimic recover so that I can get past these awful early chip damages and maybe survive a little bit longer, but notice that I don't take damage anyway. Alakazam goes for recover and he promptly gets knocked out on the next turn and next up is Executor and I get the really lucky body slam critical hit and I just take it out in one hit. I avoid any annoyances that the Eggman could have tossed out on me, but this leads us into Cloyster, the Ender of Runs. And our health is looking pretty good, and I'm ready for a battle at this point. But a turn 1 Body Slam paralyzes Cloyster, and it doesn't even get to move. And on our next turn, Body Slam crits once again, and just knocks it out. I'm almost pissed off that I'm not getting a chance to use my recover strategy at this point. Then comes in Ninetales, and it gets off a critical hit quick attack. But hey, what's this? We get another critical hit Body Slam. What is going on right now? The luck has been godlike. And now it comes down to Jolteon, Eevee's uncle. Turn 1, it goes for Thunder, and we take big damage and we go down to half health. A Body Slam of our own takes down the Jolteon into the red, but we no longer have Quick Attack to this point. At this point, I've never made it this far into the run, and I don't want to risk it. But I guess I didn't notice that it was paralyzed until I was watching this footage, because I could have just won right here. Instead, I go for Recover to get back to full health and to play it as safe as possible even though that was not the correct play. Next turn, Jolteon is fully paralyzed, then Eevee scoops his ass off the ground and goes for one more final finishing move body slam to seal the deal and get us out of this hellacious, awful run. And it's over. Eevee has done it and the Elite Four really wasn't as bad as I thought it would, but we know the few rough spots that Eevee had during this run. So what are my thoughts on it? Well, to be blunt about it, I thought it was awful. 6 hours and 58 minutes of in-game time while having to be at level 80 puts it pretty low on the list. The part in Lavender Town with the Ghastlies, there's no hesitation right now. Zero hesitation that Eevee is an easy D tier and I hope that none of you ever want to replicate this run, much less go through four of these runs. Just watch the video and be content with that, I beg of you. For now, just on the merit of being a lower level and having a faster time, it's going to be ahead of Cubone. This will also probably be the only Pokemon I do in the yellow version, 
Unless you guys really like it, maybe I can go back with a lower tier Pokemon, but I want to keep those high tier Pokemon on red and blue so that I can keep a consistent tier list going. Now, some closing thoughts on the yellow version. And I'll say that overall I prefer red and blue, but there are some interesting changes here. I think that the first half of the game is vastly easier, and the Brock nerf would be a boost to a lot of Pokemon's overall time. I think that Koga is extremely annoying with the changes, and it uses a very cheap strategy. Blaine and especially Giovanni are much improved in this version. The Elite Four is overall, they feel about the same uh, with slightly better movesets, but Agatha and her move pool changes make her so much easier than Red and Blue, and that's generally what I feel like is the rough part of the entire run, so I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'm also indifferent on the rival battles and the changes there with the Eevee. It just kind of changes out one sand attacker for another and they more or less have the same coverage on their final team so it's whatever to me. But be sure to let me know what you think about this and this one has been a nightmare not only to play four different times but also to record. Uh, I'm looking at my timer right now and it's on close to an hour. I'm sure I'm going to cut most of this out and we'll try to get you the shortest video that I can. But if you've made it this far, I appreciate you. And I hope that everything is going well for you, as well as a turn one bod into two nightshades on a ghastly on the very first attempt. But that's about it for me, and I guess I'll see you guys on the next video. Bye!